So, as you can see on the screen, my talk is entitled A Facelift for Science Journalism, but before I tell you what that's about, I'm going to show you a comic that I found online that I thought was pretty funny. So here we have a scientist interacting with a journalist, and the scientist is saying, we destroyed 10% of cancer cells in a lab rat's tail. That sounds pretty cool. So the journalist is really excited about this, and he takes it to the newspapers the next day, and the newspapers read, cancer cured. <laughs> obviously, that's not what that means. But unfortunately, uh, this comic, even though it's supposed to be funny, is a very good representation of what happens in science journalism. When you think about terms like the fat gene, the god particle, these weren't coined by the scientists that were involved in the research. These were coined by the journalists that were talking about these issues in the media. Now, why does this happen? Well, it happens because science journalism does not look like this diagram. I show you this diagram because this is kind of what I thought science journalism effectively was, this comfortable overlap between scientists and journalists, and the overlap that represents the information that is eventually passed down to you. Unfortunately, science journalism really looks a lot more like this. So on the top left, you have a very small, uh, secluded community of scientists doing, doing original research. It is incredibly hard to get original research published because you have uh, an extremely rigorous peer reviewing process. So other scientists are going to critique your article to bits, and only if it passes that test will you actually get your study published. But unfortunately, when a science finding comes out of that little bubble and it's taken up by the media, the scientists no longer moderate where the information goes or what actually happens to it. It's really just journalists and people sharing that information with each other. So, what actually happens? So here we have the original science article. So this is the article that was written by the scientists, the original study. So then it gets picked up by mainstream media. And mainstream media can basically involve anything, you know, TV, news, radio, what have you, internet. Um, and then people start sharing it with each other on your you know, social media platforms. That's Facebook, that's Twitter, and uh, if you're really lucky, BuzzFeed. Um, so let's say you know that the information that you get is diluted, it's, it's warped, um, and you want to get to the source. So you want to find that original science article for yourself. What are you going to find? Let's say you use the internet to find this article. Here is a boring screenshot of what an original science paper looks like. So there's a really wordy um, title at the top, structure and function of auditory cortex, music and speech. Um, there's an abstract underneath that's really filled with tons of jargon. But if you look closely, you'll see that it's actually $37.95. It'll cost you $37.95 to actually read this article if I get the full text. And this is the case for a lot of, uh, journal, of journal publications out there. In order to get this raw material, you need to shell out money. It's free for anyone who is a researcher, but if you're not a researcher, that's the only other choice you have. Let's say you were really gung-ho and you shell out $37.95 to read an original paper. What are you going to get? Well, you probably get some graphs, some more graphs, some graphs, <laughs> probably a few more graphs. And these aren't just simple graphs either. These are graphs that are strapped down by incredibly boring and, and rigid and complicated statistical analyses. But what if we talk about the most basic statistical analyses that go into research? These are two um, statistics equations that are used to test, to evaluate your data, because it's not enough to just collect data. You need to then run it through some rigorous analyses to show how well that data supports your hypotheses. Your hypotheses can be anything. It could be something as simple as, is drug A better than drug B? Are SAT scores higher now than they were 10 years ago? Are humans contributing to climate change or are they not? In all of these cases, you don't just look at your data, you need to run these rigorous tests on it. So what I'm trying to say is science is complicated. It's not just a matter of taking one buzzword and turning that into a sensational phenomenon, which is currently what we see when we read about any kind of scientific issue in the in mainstream media. So what, is it, what, what alternatives do we have? Well, 
Effectively, a science journalist needs to be one part scientist and one part journalist. And the two skill sets that come into uh, being an effective science journalist are as follows. So as a scientist, you need to be able to do research and also understand it and also be able to critique research because not all research is created equal. To give you an example, if you were going to assess um, stress, let's say you wanted to compare studies that looked at stress, you can look at a study that asks people to rate their individual stress levels, or you can look at a study that takes uh, that measures stress hormones in your saliva. Now, it's not that any, either of these two methods are inaccurate; they're both great methods. It's, it's just that one of them is more objective than the other. And when we read about these key issues in the media, um, journalists have a tendency to treat all of these articles the same because it's research. A scientist did it somewhere and published a study. That's all the validity that is talked about at that level. So as a journalist, you need to be able to communicate and engage your audience. So it's not just enough to really be a scientist and know how to do all this stuff. You need to be engaging and you need to be able to basically create interest in this topic, and that requires a skill that needs to be taught. So how do we bring these skill sets together? I reckon you can do that with a Master's in Science Communication. Now, this program is actually offered in a few universities around the world. Um, unfortunately, it is not a standard for being a science journalist. Um, if it became a standard, we can look at a program that can that can open up careers to all kinds of undergraduates graduating from various science programs as well as communications programs. Now, what would this program entail? It would have two parts. The first part is research methods and statistics. So really spend that time understanding what it means to do scientific research. What is the scientific method? What are some of the most basic statistics that go into conducting scientific evaluations? And then the second part is your journalistic portion. So that's communicating and then evaluating what you're actually reading in, across science papers. Allow your audience to read a, a very, very well-reviewed summary of the literature instead of just spitting it out there and forming uh, ideas that scientists never wanted to share in the first place. If we have this kind of a program in place, if this becomes a standard, then maybe we can look at science journalism as its own specialty, with its own agencies. And I reckon it can be actually be quite lucrative in the process. And if we have this kind of a specialty, then maybe we can think about uh, the process of educating people instead of systematically misinforming them on scientific issues. Thank you very much.